There was one play in this game that has really stuck with me, and I think it shows just how bad this game was really coached. Now, we all saw during the game, and it's been discussed ad nauseum, but the clock management during this game was bad. And Bowles' excuses for it are not making the fan base feel any better. You cannot preach accountability and then not take blame for something that everybody from the broadcasters to the podcasters saw was a mistake. But the play I'm talking about that's going to show how bad the coaching was in this game was the fourth quarter, 37 seconds left, touchdown catch by the tight end of Joku that tied the game and took it in overtime. Now, we all know that tendencies and matchups are a big thing in football. Coaches and players, they scowl over game film looking for any advantage to try and get see those tendencies and get those matchups that they can exploit. They do this both in preparation for the game and during the game. On that fourth and 11 touchdown, catch the Browns saw a tendency and a matchup that they exploited on our podcast preview in this game we talked about Devin White and how his weakness is in coverage he is not a coverage guy mm -hmm. you know don't drop him back into Tampa 2 you know 20 yards down the field it's just not him and don't get me wrong I like Devin White I think he's a great player and I'm proud to have him on the team but all players have strengths and weaknesses Devin White's weakness just so happens to be his coverage skills. I would say he's a little bit below average. Whenever the Browns went to an open backfield set with five route runners, the Bucks had a tendency to run this scheme. Two back safeties, two corners on the outside, two zone underneath, and middle field open with a linebacker in man coverage. Now this is all zone except for the linebacker in man coverage. The two safeties always turn to the outside, leaving the middle of the field wide open. Notice the linebacker is in man coverage while everyone else is in zone. So, of course, when the Browns go for it on 4th and 11, they line up with an empty backfield set, and lo and behold, what do they get? They get the look and the matchup they want. And the matchup they want is linebacker Devin White, man coverage against their tight end with zero help, and middle field open. And you can see Brissett had all intentions to throw it to Njoku from the start. He locks on and stares him down, never once even looking to his left, barely glancing to his right. Now this was the perfect case of the Browns exploiting a tendency in a matchup. How Bowles did not see this is beyond me. But wait, it gets even worse. It was fourth and 11 with 37 seconds left. Stop this play and the game's over. Bucks win. Everyone on the planet knew they were going to pass the ball. Everyone. So why did you not blitz? You're known for blitzing. Specifically, why did you not rush Devin White? Devin White had rushed 11 times in this game so far on 33 pass attempts by Brissett. That's a third of Brissett's pass attempts. In those 11 rushes by Devin White, the Browns did not get one single first down. They averaged less than two yards per pass when Devin White rushed. Two of those rushes led to sacks. And not all those rushes by White were blitzes either. Only four of the 11 were blitzes. The other seven times, it was just a four-man rush. And at this point in the game, Brissett had only completed four passes for 10 yards or more, the longest being 17. And none of those passes came during a Devin White rush. So instead of rushing Devin White on the most important play of the game when you know they're going to pass the ball, you instead put Devin White in man coverage on an island deep down the middle of the field. But wait, it gets even worse. Again, let me reiterate, this is a 4th and 11 play. There's 37 seconds left on the clock. You stop this play, you win the game. Game over. Everyone knows the Browns are going to pass. So even though you decide not to rush Devin White, who's been in a very effective pass rusher this whole game, and you know this is going to be a pass play, you put your most effective pass rushers out on the field, right? Well, if you thought that away, you'd be wrong. Because obviously what you do is you leave your best and most veteran players on the bench. And instead, you put in Jannard Avery, who has had 31 defensive snaps all year long coming into this game, Logan Hall, your second-string rookie, and backup defensive lineman Nacho. I mean, it just makes sense to play them instead of your big offseason free agent signing Akeem Hicks, or your pro bowler and best defensive lineman Vita Vea, or even veterans Nassib. And Nelson, I mean, not to knock Nacho and Logan Hall and Avery, 
but it just makes no sense. And as you can see, they got zero pressure on a known pass play. So there you have it. I'm just absolutely befuddled as to what was happening during this game, coaching-wise. I mean, these, these were very poor decisions in a very crucial part of the game. I'm afraid that Todd Bowles just does not have the win-at-all-cost attitude. I mean, besides the poor clock management, just this play alone is really starting to make me question whether Bowles is the guy. Now, look, I'm not calling for anybody to be fired, but I want things to change. The things I want to change are I want to see the Bucks start winning. I want to see them stop losing against below-average teams. Now, of course, Bowles isn't out there making tackles and doing the blocking. But when it all comes down to it, everything's going to fall on his head. It's his responsibility. And if he wants to keep this job, he's going to have to do a lot better. And if you're going to preach accountability, you got to take blame when you screw up. That's all I got. Till next time, go Bucks.